Hi, thanks very much. Man, they weren't kidding, I can't see any of you. I just trust you're all out there. Um, this is great. Uh, look at this stage in this venue. Like, I saw the pictures from last year, I wasn't here, but it's like really something, right? It's like a TED talk. It's like anything I say, you're gonna trust just implicitly. It's really such a feeling of power. What could I say? Mary had a little lamb. Mm, so con contemplative. Um, so, uh, I'm not here to make bad jokes. I'm here to talk about Go, obviously. Uh, but I'd also like to make uh, a case for microservices. And I know, great, you're thinking, I see this junk on Hacker News like six times a day. I don't need to hear more microservice nonsense. Well, if you hate it too much, that's fine. I made this bingo card for you. So you can take your phone. You can take a little Snapchat of that. And uh, every time I say one of these dumb things, you can put a little emoji poo on it. And then at the end, you can tweet it at me, I guess. And um, yeah, you won't win anything, but maybe it'll make you feel better. Yeah, I, I want to make a case for microservices at a Go conference. Uh, because I think they represent something powerful, really powerful. In the same way, I think, I'll argue, that uh, Go represents something powerful. But it's not going to be a technical case. Because by all accounts, uh, the technical case for microservices is not so great, actually. Um, maybe some of you have seen this tweet. <laughs> I can kind of see you now because this is white. Has anybody, is anybody running microservices like in production? Like maybe 30%, okay. It's, it's true, right? Like this is, this is how this works. Um, plenty of personal experience. And yet people keep pushing this, this meme. And it's kind of too bad, right? Because there's a lot of problems with microservices. There's problems with dis distribution. Distributed systems are necessarily vulnerable to a huge class of problems, of failure modes. And there's obvious ones, like ones you can think of, right? Like if machines are down, or network links are saturated, or things like this, and you have to plan for that. There's plenty of failure modes that you probably won't think of, like asymmetric partitions, split brain, TCP retransmission errors, stuff that you had no reason to think of before. There's even things that you would think are impossible, like out-of-order delivery. And even if things go well and none of these things happen, there's huge performance problems too, right? What used to be a function call that took nanoseconds is now an RPC call over the network. It takes microseconds or milliseconds or seconds, maybe. There's architectural problems in the sense that, well, you struggle to define boundaries. What constitutes a microservice? Where are the borders? And there's often not a right answer, too. You tend to end up with a lot of code duplication, which can be problematic. And that code isn't necessarily bound to a specific language, because, of course, microservices are polyglot. That's great for some people, and it's a lot harder for your organization, right? Because it makes being proficient in your whole stack very difficult. Then, when you start testing, things get really hairy, right? To test your site, you need to kind of herd these 60 cats into a huge integration environment. You need some way of specifying which versions are supposed to work with each other. And once you've accomplished that impossible task, you need to write a system that's actually, you need to write a system test that's actually reliable. And then you need to wire it into continuous integration. And you're doing continuous deployment too, right? Probably not. Operationally, things are perhaps worst of all, right? What used to be a single artifact in motion through all the testing and QA stages is now like a probability cloud of actors. What version is in production? All of them, all the versions, they're all there. Deployment tooling becomes critical, right? Automation, and you realize that your automation really isn't that great. Or worse, each microservice is deployed independently and using different tools or different methodologies and perhaps even in an incompatible way to the same target. And you do want to pack multiple services per target, per host, for utilization purposes, but then you end up having noisy neighbors. So you implement quotas, but then the OM killer or whatever is wreaking havoc on your services because you didn't specify it properly. There's a lot of problems with microservices. And in the same way, I think I want to argue, there's a lot of apparent problems with Go. You don't have to spend much time on Hacker News to read about them in, in perpetuity. We've repeated the billion dollar mistake. We have nil pointers. 
We have no macros, no compile time macros, kind of. We have no templated types. We have no inheritance. We have no operator overloading. We have no keyword args. We have limited restricted access to memory, memory layout. Our error handling is incredibly verbose. For many domains that people care about, uh, garbage collection is a showstopper. These are, in some sense, costs, right, and downsides. But I think what we recognize as Go developers is that these costs and these downsides have a payoff. There are benefits that follow directly from these things. And in my view, chief among them is the tooling, the richness of Go's tooling ecosystem. Go fix, go fump, go vet, go lint. Third party tools like the Go code autocompletion daemon, uh, the Go oracle. All of these things rely, to some degree, on the sparsity of the underlying language and some of these missing features. Not that it would be impossible to build these tools with a more, uh, with a richer language underneath, but that it would be much harder. The presence of macros in Rust, for example, makes it very difficult to effectively and efficiently uh, produce and manipulate Rust ASTs, which in turn makes a Rust autocompletion daemon a really tricky prospect. And losing inheritance in favor of composition or structural subtyping, we actually eliminate entire classes of design errors. Similarly, we lose threads, but gain Go routines and eliminate entire classes of concurrency errors. GC eliminates classes of memory errors. The distillation of, of errors, of error types to pure values, to mere values, increases verbosity in a sense, but it seems to make us more thoughtful as we write code and it seems to make our code more resilient. These benefits are perhaps dissatisfying to someone walking a feature checklist and comparing languages. But Go programmers understand that they are sort of real and, and powerful things. Go's ethos is a certain quixotic, sometimes polarizing structural simplicity, which in turn enables a whole host of higher order virtues improving programming in the large. I'd like to argue that while microservices impose real, often, very often, underestimated costs on your architecture, I think those costs can actually be thought of as virtuous in the same way, as virtuous constraints. So when you design a distributed system, you open yourself up to all these errors, it's true. But it's a lot better to build defenses against those errors in from day one than to try to bolt a defense on on day 100 or 300. And in our zeitgeist, you're only going to have to, you're going to have to think distributed at some point. When function calls are RPCs from day one, you think carefully about your APIs and about defining encapsulation in a smart way. Code duplication and multiple languages they have downsides, but they enable an experimentation, and they enable you to build things that are suitable to their purpose. Difficult end-to-end -end tests force an investment in unit and integration testing, which is, I think, correct. There was this thing on uh, the Google testing blog where they had the pyramid of how you should structure your testing. They say 70% unit tests, 20% integration tests, 10% end-to-end tests. I think that's right. An increased emphasis on deployment automation is often very painful in the short term, but a game changer in the long term. And all the big organizations, Netflix, SoundCloud, they've reaped the benefits of this and they're moving a lot faster. Forcing teams to think carefully about consumer-driven contracts, interactions between services, and responsibility boundaries brings all the benefits of sort of spec-driven development. And in fact, I think the single exemplary virtue of microservices is exactly this, this bounded context, right? It's a term that comes from domain-driven design. There, it's more of a business context, so that a single microservice should map to a single business domain, not a technical domain, which is kind of what happens naturally when you split a monolith apart. Martin Fowler, who's a uh, ThoughtWorks guy, uh, he describes nouns with subtly different definitions across contexts. He calls them polysemes, I think. And 
his idea is that each context should implement its own consistent view of a polyseme and define mappings for other contexts. So a customer in the context of a customer support domain might be totally different than a customer in the context of a sales domain. And each of those domains, each of those bounded contexts should have an internally consistent view that it cares about, that makes sense to it. And there should be mappings, clearly defined mappings from one domain to the other. Bounded contexts also hide implementation details like databases, promoting encapsulation. They nudge you towards an active object or a message, message passing architectural model, which, especially in the large, is rational, coherent, understandable. Services exist to be called, to do work independently without side effects, and to yield results, synchronously, importantly. Which to me sounds a lot like good Go API design. Indeed, as Go promotes virtues at the language level, I want to argue that microservices promote the same sort of virtues at the architecture level. But I'm using virtue very vaguely here. What makes software virtuous? Or maybe to make it a bit uh, more abstract, what, what even is software, right? One definition I like is by a guy called Dan North. Um, he says that the goal of software development is to sustainably minimize lead time to business impact, which sounds like something someone in a suit would say. But I think there's wisdom here. Uh, the important thing to, to see here is that the goal of software is not to, the goal of software development is not to produce software. Actually, software isn't an asset. It's a cost, it's a liability. We should be optimizing for code that has a very short half-life, can be easily destroyed and remade in a new image. In a talk at CppCon, I think this year, uh, Titus Winters, who I believe oversees C++ development at Google in some capacity, he's getting at the same idea from a slightly different angle. He said that uh, on the subject of sustainability, that your code is sustainable when you're able to change all the things that you ought to change safely for the lifetime of that code base. I can find a lot more quotes like this, I think, um, but we're getting at a specific idea of virtue and virtue in software. Ultimately, the most important virtue of software in itself is mutability, I think. Good software is software that can and does adapt to, it, to its environment, its business environment, its, its technical environment, its logical environment. Or as Andrew Duran put it in 2012, good code is code that grows with grace. Because as we know, software's never finished, right? That's why we're all employed. But how do we enable mutability? And in my mind, the way we do that is with confidence. We give ourselves confidence to mutate. We're able to change what we need to change. And we all want to do it, right? We got into this profession to program, to be programmers, because we believe in the, in the power of the idea of, of creation in this sense, right? We want to do this sort of thing. And our tools should help us do that. Our tools should give us confidence to do the sorts of things we want to do. And for confidence, for me, comes happiness. Let's pick the tools that make us happy. And I mean happiness in like the Epicurean sense, right? Ataraxia, a freedom from worry, which is enabled by the pursuit of, of virtue. Our architecture should allow us quick iterations, low-risk experimentation, continuous refactoring, crucially, continuous refactoring never producing code that we don't know how it works and we're afraid to touch. That's the worst feeling for me when I start a new project or I join a new team and there's code there that exists and I'm afraid to touch it. That's, we should never, we should never feel that way, I think. As Dan North puts it, uh, microservices allow us to write code that fits in our head and when that's true, you open up a whole world of possibility. Our language, similarly, should allow us to understand quickly and make changes authoritatively. Go's small surface area, the tiny spec, orthogonal feature set. It allows us to know what we're doing. I love Go for this. That's what got me into the language in the beginning, and I think we all do here. I think Go is a language that lets me confidently express myself without doubt of the unknown. And I love microservices for this. They let me experiment and build and rebuild, freely engage in the act of creation without fear, from idea to products a solution that's a perfect fit for the problem. So I have this project, I'm working on this thing. Um, it's meant to make microservices in Go kind of a nicer experience. And um, 
So it's collecting necessary things, right? Circuit breakers and rate limiters and instrumentation and um, transports, different transports, depending on what you're using. It defines a way of structuring microservice applications that are safe and performant and adaptable to different needs and environments. And it does so in a way that's slightly opinionated, but not too opinionated. Uh, it reflects a lot of my and my contributors' experience in running microservices in, in large-scale production. And I hope it can help some people. Specifically, I hope it can help those of us in larger organizations. And I'm curious, how many people work in companies of like over 100 engineers? Yeah, so you know change is often quite difficult. And uh, the organization itself can be kind of resistant to change, right? In smaller companies and startups, it's often very easy to make an experiment, try a new language, try a new way of doing things, try a new way of deploying code, of operating your, your, your stack. See where it gets you, and then go with it if it works. But in larger companies and like enterprise scale companies, that's often not true. There's often a natural resistance to chain. There's process that has been calcified for good reasons, but it's there. And that's grown organically, and it can inhibit this kind of experimentation and this kind of progress. And in my view, it inhibits happiness. So I created GoKit primarily, or at least among other reasons, as a method of addressing that kind of resistance. Something you can bring to your engineering director and say, look, this thing, it exists, people are using it, it's real, you can kind of trust it, let's give this a shot. I'm being very deliberate with it, I'm growing it very slowly with careful thought, or what I think is careful thought, and I'm very interested in helping those of you who might benefit from it. So if you think this might help, let me know. Uh, if this area is interesting to you, I'm always looking for contributors. I hope it will create some happiness in the world. So I want to say, first of all, Thank you to the Go authors for giving me a tool that makes me happy at the language level. I want to say thank you to all of you for coming. I want to say thank you to all the other presenters, all the other speakers. I'm looking forward to the talks from the community to find out what makes them happy. And I hope that my hope, my talk of happiness, has made you a little bit happier too. So thanks for listening.